It's 6.30, so I get the time to start. We're certainly delighted to have all of you here uh, tonight. We are uh, especially delighted to have our two historians here. Who I believe they're going to talk to each other, but at night they're going to be all excited. <laughs> and, and, uh, but, but it, we also, uh, of course, we hope you, uh, those of you haven't been to the, the museum uh, uh, lately, come down and have a look. We, we haven't uh, actually made a lot of physical uh, progress during the last 30 days. On the other hand, we're about as excited as we've ever been, or maybe more so, about what's going on there and what's going to uh, to be done. So in, in the next few months, we're really going to make a tremendous uh, amount of uh, progress. We've gotten uh, uh, another $25,000 from uh, the West Parish Tourism, plus uh, some other very nice gifts, and, and that'll get us part way there. And, uh, but we've spent a lot of money, and so we hope that all of you will continue the very good support that you've given us in the past. Uh, and as uh, are you going to say any words of wisdom? <laughs> I always have to say words of wisdom. <laughs> okay. But, but we're, we're certainly glad to have Cliff and Gardner here tonight. Gardner. Right, <laughs> Excuse me. Tell y'all what my shoes fell apart while ago. <laughs> so my shoe was... I just want to remind everybody to please turn your cell phones off. Uh, also, look at you. <laughs> Y'all forgot. Um, Phil is recording it tonight, and so this uh, DVD will be available tomorrow or the next day for you to purchase. And also, this is our last uh, night for the museum for the year. So after we get this one, if you have not purchased uh, the whole collection, you'll be able to purchase the whole collection, which is nine DVDs for $75, so it'll save you a little money if you'd like to get that whole collection. We'll have that in the next couple of days. Also, last one, um, we did not have the program that we expected to have, but we ended up really getting a nice DVD. Uh, Phil went later and recorded John as he spoke to someone else, uh, another group, and he also went to uh, Town & Country and spoke to a lady there about her experiences through the tornado, he also went and spoke to a uh, gentleman uh, that told about his experiences. So if you'd like to pick up that DVD tonight, we have that. So it's got a lot more on it than what you saw here. Uh, and we have those for $10. Um, as I said, this will be our last one for the year, but we will start again in January. Uh, we've already got speakers booked for the first four months out of the year. So you'll continue to get your cards, uh, in the mail. We've also got in the cookbooks, I think. I don't remember if you had those in last time, the last meeting. Uh, those are selling extremely fast. We had 41 cases. We're down to, I think, less than 15 cases now. So if you want to get cookbooks for Christmas, try to get them tonight. I got a uh, special gift wrapping for them today. So please be sure to pick those up. Um, have I forgotten anything? Dad, have I forgotten anything? <laughs> Um, we will be drawing for our raffle uh, later on, so I'll give you another chance. So be thinking about uh, whether you want to get one of the $10 raffle tickets, and we'll also draw for our door prize. And so if you didn't sign up for that, I'll give you another opportunity to sign a card before we do that tonight. Uh, but right now, I'm going to turn it over to our Webster Parish historian, John Amen, and he's going to introduce our speaker for the evening. <coughs> Okay, first, uh, just a minute for a personal point. I appreciate everybody did some nice things to our family. Yes, my mother passed away last month, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I'll start off tonight with this introduction, telling me a little bit about what I guess you call inside baseball, the inside things about historians. Among academic historians, there are certain, um, what word do I want to use? This is a family audience. Uh, certain snobs that uh, look down on local history. Uh, I had a wonderful professor at Louisiana Tech that uh, really tried to trash my thesis because, you know, his area was the diaspora of the Spanish settlements in the New World. And, you know, my writing about stuff in Louisiana just didn't seem like it cut it for him. And I guess uh, I come down on the other side of that because 
To me, the local historians are the people that really do history, get out and do the work. And our speaker tonight, he doesn't remember the first time I met him, and I wish I could put a date on it. It's about 30 years ago, and I found there was another, I would use a not so family order, another idiot in the Webster Parish Library that day, making them crazy when they had to go upstairs and bring back down the newspaper volumes. And I'm going, wow, there's somebody else that's as disturbed as I am. Uh, except I think he may be better disturbed because uh, Cliff Garden's done yeoman work for local history in Bossier Parish. Uh, it's got five books, but that's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, when Thad saw us talking shop back there, what he is is he brought us pictures that uh, he's uncovered that I've never seen of the, the Yellow Pine Sawmill and perhaps either the Yellow Pine School or the Joe Pine School. We got a little letter, it's a little funny there, but I think it is Yellow Pine. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. I was at a ceremony recently at Bipsy where he helped uncover the picture of Mary Bennett Kane, the mother of Bossier and Shreveport that had been the way it existed. So, this man does the work, he knows the work, and he's gonna to touch on something tonight that I almost kind of feel guilty about. I think I've part of his talk, but I've kind of helped contribute to. You know, we, we come up here and we say, Webster Parish was created out of Clayton Parish. And like he said, you get some very confused folks trying to find where their family was in Cotton Valley was. Because from 1843 to the time Webster Parish was created, from Dorchin Bow to Clark's Bow was Bossier Parish. And you're looking at a mystery, and it's, uh, I gave a talk once, not too long ago at Spring Hill, talking about the lost kinship between Menden and Spring Hill. I don't think they liked it too much. They still don't want to be kin to us. But there's a, there's a little, there's a great association between Bossier and Webster. And uh, as I said, I'm excited not to hear what Cliff's got to say, but this Cliff Carden is the historian of Bossier Parish, and he's done a wonderful job, and uh, he's going to have interesting things to tell us tonight. John. 
because normally they contact a professor and they say, we want to do a history book on your area. And the professor will run around in his car, take a whole roll of new pictures, write stuff about it and send it to them. And they have to reject it because it contains no historical pictures. And they related this story to me. And it was after that fact that they finally met John. John, as far as I know, was the only professor they've ever hired to do it because the work done by professors was not up to their standard of looking for an 1893 picture of Halton High School and that type of stuff. So I get to turn the tables on John and talk about him a little. I was proud to do this book. Uh, it didn't make me a lot of money. Probably didn't make John a lot of money. It's not how we pay our bills. This one was a diary that we had uncovered. And actually, we as Mosier historians, when I say that, John Morris Manor, who was a gentleman who preceded me, that did a lot of tremendous work. Rupert Payton did a lot of tremendous work. John Manor, of course, lost his eyesight before he could ever finish his book. <laughs> when I started doing my work, I came across his work, and he had found the infamous King Diary. Now, this diary is sitting in the Texas State Archives. They paid $175 for this diary in 1947. Now, that translates to a lot of money when you're buying paper product in the 1940s. But they had it, and ironically had misidentified the owner. Had said his name was William N. King. Well, I've got it. Of course, it's talking about Bossier and events. And, and if you ever do a, a search of how many William King served in the Civil War, there's over a thousand. So, but he, he made one food call that fixed it. He said, today I went to Bellevue to check on a lawsuit. And of course, that's when you go over right into the courthouse and pull out the daily register and you start looking. His mother had sued him to remove him as executor of his father's estate because William King was gone to the Civil War. She needed permission to sell things to feed the younger family members. In other words, to get the permission that she needed, she was going to have to remove him as executor have someone else appointed executor that she could work with to feed the younger children in the house. And that's how we finally identified William King. To tell you how much fun this can be, we found his granddaughter, great-granddaughter, living in Fort Worth, Texas. And I called her, and I told her about this diary. She had no idea what it was. I copied this 400-page diary and I mailed it to her. And I called her and said, we need someone in the family to give us permission to publish this book. And her reaction to me was, no. I don't want anyone making any money off my great-grandfather's works. And I said, ma'am, let me explain something to you. If you think that me and Gary Jordan are making any money writing these books, we'll let you talk to our wives, okay? <laughs> we'll let you figure this out real quick. And we left it at that. A year later, she calls me and she says, did you ever publish the diary? And I was not in a good mood that day. And I said, no, ma'am, I can quote you exactly. Your words were, no, you did not want anyone making money off your grandfather's works. And she said, I'm sorry. She said, I didn't realize I'd stop the book. I said, we have to have permission from a family member publisher. I said, a law that ironically Nixon had passed in the 70s. But all diaries not published before 1974 were protected by copyright till the year 2002. He extended the copyright law. But we finally, she gave us permission, ironically the date had expired anyway, but we got her permission to publish the book and we went with University of Tennessee Publishing because they do large books and they understood that this was a 360 page diary without footnotes and annotations. And of course, Gary covered the Civil War side of it I covered the local Bossier side of it because when he talked about the Ratcliffe's of Collinsburg, I knew what he was talking about. So that was the last one that was done. We'll lead up to a lot of other stuff, but that's not what I'm here. I'll give Shelly the job passing these out and just let people look at them. That's what I tend to do when I give a speech. <coughs> now, when Shelly called me and asked me to speak to y'all, of course, my automatic response, and I, I guess I'm either good at this or bad at this. I said, well, let's cover what Bozier and Webster have in common. Because as John alluded to, when I get a call from someone and they say, well, my great-grandfather was living in Webster Parish in 1880, 
put out in the 1970 census. He's not a player, but I can't find him anymore. And I said, well, did you look in Bozier? And I said, well, why would I look in Bozier? I said, well, you're going to have to understand how the area was formed. So was, was he living on the east side of Dorchie or on the west side of Dorchie? Well, I don't know. It was just in the 1880 census register. So we have to decide to understand that. So the first thing, the Bozier, Webster, claims commonality is that they were both carved from Claiborne Parish. Well, if you go back far enough, that was all clay up carved from Natchez Parish. Natchez was one of the original 12 parishes, 13 parishes that Louisiana was formed in 1811. But so that you're doing research, and if you're lucky enough that your ancestors have been here pre-American, there are actually seven American papers that if you owned land here before the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, you had to go before a hearing committee and present evidence that you bought the land from either the Spanish and French or the Indians, and it had to be approved by Congress. And those papers exist, and you can pull them down and you can study who they who applied and who were their witnesses that said that they lived here. And when you look at the history books and you understand that in 1806, Freeman and Questus came through, but the only person that they met white when they came through was a gentleman called Francis Louise Grout. And he was the Indian translator. And he actually lived on an island in Red River, but he also had a bachelor or a ranch, which is now in Unville Parish on the east side of Bissonnette. But he was the one that kept him from getting lost, he kept getting lost. So, but he was one of the early Americans, one of the earlier settlers here. Now, as John can relate to you, most of you may or not, may not know, one of the next ones to arrive was Isaac Alden, settled in an area north of Minden. But Isaac, of course, that's even another connection of Bozier Western has that Isaac's son, Paolo, moves to North Bozier and starts a little town up there called Al Alden Solomon, which became all of Louisiana. So same family. And ironically, the Aldens moved to Bennett, Arkansas, and one of their son in law serves as state representative for Arkansas. So the, the transitions. But we both claim a descendancy from Claiborne. I said, why does this matter? Because of genealogists contact us, we need to know which way to lead them, which side of the door she are they from. Because when they formed Bozier in 1843, everything from Red River to Dorchy to the state line was what was inside Bozier. Bozier for years knew that they were going to carve part of it off. Bozier was simply demographically too large of an area. Now that actually leads into the great, uh, the great uh, moving of the courthouse out of Bellevue, because they had always assumed they had always assumed that they were going to cut Bell Bozier Parish in half along by by Calvary to make more Bozier South Bozier. That's what they had always assumed. And in 1871, when they carved Webster Parish out of Bozier and Claiborne, and they established Menden as a county seat for. Bossier Parish, for Webster Parish, but they did not move Bellevue, which they thought they would. And that was when you get into this long running 15 year fight to move the courthouse out of Bellevue. And of course, it eventually ended up in Benton. But that was actually just the first book of the history, first chapter of the history book that I wrote. It took me 22 pages to explain how they moved. <laughs> And it's how it's funny that you hear that they stole the courthouse. We even know where that came from. F.M. Grip was a, was a blacksmith in Hoff, Louisiana, keeping a diary. And he wrote in his diary that night, the Benton boys have stole the courthouse. So people will say, well, they did they really steal the courthouse? And I said, well, I don't know if you call running an ad in the paper a week before saying they're going to lose the record stealing it. You know, but you have to look at the source of the information. But we're both carved out of Claiborne, so we get to claim that. But you also have to know that so that when people contact you and they're looking for the descendancy, whether they're looking Bossier Parish before 1871, or whether they're looking Claiborne Parish before 1871. Someone who has done a lot of really good work on this, if you ever get the chance to meet him, is Bill O'Daniel. He now lives in Littleton, Colorado. <coughs> But he was descended from the Hearns, as in Hearn Dry Goods in Shreveport. And Bill, because his great grandfather's plantation was on the Envelope Camp, in what I call Eastern Bossier, 
or for simplicity reasons, I tend to call it the Bozier Webster area. He had to clarify some of those issues. And Bill literally read every conveyance from 1843 to 1871. He indexed every one of them in terms of buyer seller, and he published his books. And Bill was the one that was able to finally, we were finally able to figure out where this Confederate camp that was that was supposed to be on the Yellow Plain. And we found a reference in a history book where it said that the plantation was on was on the Hearn Sunnydale plantation. Well, unfortunately, George Hearn owned so much property that it was impossible to pinpoint. Well, then we actually got a letter that was written from the camp sent back to a gentleman that clarified it even further. And to give y'all an idea of where it is, if you come down the McIntyre Road and you hit the Animal Plant, if you could just drive straight on into the Animal Plant, you'd be there. That's where it's set. Unfortunately, it's part of the Animal Plant that's perfectly flat, so there is no land details to give you an exact location. We just we can swear about the 40 acre track. So we know. So you have to understand that when you're doing history, Bill's work is good. And of those of you who have met Tommy over here and know of her work in North Webster Parish, the only claim to fame I get there is that I met Tommy over here just a couple of months before she published her book. After she found out she had cancer, she stopped and talked to me and said, Cliff, I'm going to do my book the same way you do yours. He said, because I could not figure out a format. History is a lot like genealogy. How do you present it to people that it makes sense? If you do it chronologically, it drives you crazy, but that's the simplest way. Then you gotta do it, figure out some way to do it by subject matter. And I was very proud of the fact she said, Cliff, I just chose to do mine the way you did yours. So if you got any complaints with the way Tommy books, her book was formatted, you blame me 100 percent but if you got any complaint with the information, well, you'll have to figure that out set up. So, but that's something that we share. Now, as I mentioned, some of the early residents that we share was Isaac Alden, who settled here in 1808. But then by the next generation, his son is over in Alden Sawmill, Bozier Parish. Actually built the first bridge in Bozier Parish. Actually served as sheriff of Bozier Parish, and that's how By all also served as sheriff. He was a war time sheriff of Bozier Parish. So he, we share him. We also share Francis Louise Graff and all his running around in this territory guiding the earlier people here and helping them understand. And Francis Louise, one of the few reasons we know so much about him is referring to those American papers that I talked about earlier, where if you own land here before 1803, you had to go before Congress and get yourself approved. And then I want to give him that he had sued for his right to certain lands that he had left out of this American papers and they had to prove whether he owned them or not, and it was a Supreme Court case. A lot of people don't understand that, man, I get tickled when I go into a catfish, certain catfish place on Dorchy Bay. They used to have these little placemats, and they talked about all the wharfs along Dorchy Bay and all the steamboats and all that. I used to chuckle to myself because there were never any wharfs. If you've ever looked at a picture of a steamboat, they did not need a war, nor did they want one, because they always had a gameplay of their own. They went to so many unimproved sites that their gameplay was their war, they took it with them. But when you look at Dorchy and the history of it, it's more related to Claiborne and Bossier than it is Webster, because Webster wasn't created until 1871. And why does that date matter? Very few people realize that the only reason that Dorchy was navigable to begin with was the fact that the Red River had all these wrecks in it and was blocked. The famous river log jams of the Red River. And it was blocked all the way to roughly Fulton, Arkansas. And all that water that comes down the Red River today, <coughs> that time was spilling over into Caddo, Bossier, Claiborne parishes and filling all those streams up raising their water levels and making them navigable. So when Lieutenant Woodruff came here in 1871 through 73 and cleared out the Red River and made it navigable, which they did for one reason, trying to get to the wood that was in Arkansas that they cut and sell. They had to get steamboats, steamboats on the way to move heavy stuff like that. That was their reason. And when they fixed the Red River, all that water went back into the Red River in Caddo Lake, Soda Lake, Ferry Lake, Cross Lake, and Caddo. 
Cypress Lake, Bodkaw Lake, Dorchy, Lake Vista, all dried up. I don't know if John's ever found it, but the city of New Orleans actually sued the United States government because the city of New Orleans lost so much revenue because there were no longer steamboats going down the Dorchy Lake, down the Dorchy and Lake Vista. But New Orleans actually sued over it to try to get some revenue back from that. That actually leads us to the next thing that Bozier and Webster <coughs> shared, and that was, of course, the shed road. Why was the shed road built? To give the farmers over in Eastern Webster, and actually Claiborne Parish, that used to go to Dorchy and ship their goods to New Orleans, they had to get them to New Orleans. <coughs> but the only way to do it was to go to Shreveport. But because of that infamous Red River flooding, Red Sheep Flats, where Louisiana Downs is today, used to stay flooded six months out of the year. And it was Judge John Watkins from Memphis who noticed that if you took that clay of the Red Sheep Flats, built it up three feet and let it dry, it would stay hard. So if you kept shed over it to keep it dry, you made a hard road bed. Because very few people realize that in those days, you went from Memphis, <coughs> you had to go to Bellevue, to Benton and back down to Bossier City because you couldn't make the cross Red Sheep Flats. But the <coughs> Watkins had a better idea. Let's shed the road. And there were two types of roads for those that don't understand. There are corduroy roads, which means you take logs and pile them next to each other. It's a corduroy road. And you have shed road. Why well, happened in Shreveport was a corduroy road. You took logs and pile them next to each other. But Shed Road was unique. Longest roof covered, dirt floored roadway in America. It was unique enough that in 1882, the Scientific American newspaper sent a reporter all the way down here to do a story on it. We have never figured out why he didn't take pictures of it. No known pictures of the Shed Road. We never have found it. If I'm good, one of these days I'll find it. I don't think I will. That's another thing that was shared, not only with those in those prayers, but it benefited Webster and Claiborne, and it was financed by John Watkins. The ironic thing was John continually went to the merchants in Shreveport and said, you're going to benefit from this. Shreveport never contributed a single dollar toward the shared roof. Now John was lucky enough that from the time that it was very usable from about 82 from about 78 to about 84, he made roughly $20,000 a year profit off of it. So he received his investment in return. He was unlucky enough that in 1884, Vicks Works Report and Pacific finished their railroad and pretty much annihilated the need for the shed road. It is said the shed road was so fine that when the mules came walking down out of the Redshoe Hills, Eric Brooks, they would start braying and running because they knew the rest and the next three miles were going to be just a piece of cake. That's how final the road way it was. That's something else that we share. And that leads us to the next thing, which of course was the Vicksburg Shreveport and Pacific. Now of course it was the ends of Vicksburg Shreveport and Texas Railroad in the 1850s. But the financing of VS and T fell apart. Civil War got in the middle of everything. So it ended. But in 1884, July the 4th, actually, of 84, they actually finished the VSP Railroad and started shipping goods across. Why did that change things so much? I'll give you a perfect example. Menden was on the railroad in Fillmore, Princeton, Rocky Mount, Red Lair, all those towns in Bossier were not. None of those towns existed there. All the new towns, Bossier City, Halton, and eventually Plainville, Benton, those were the new towns created after the railroad came through. They were created towns. They took a lot of land, divided it up, and turned it into a railroad town. It was ironic that back the town, the post office made a law that the post office had to be within half a mile of the railroad. Benton was in actually moved. A lot of people don't know that. If you go to Benton today and look at it, that's not where the original Benton was. It was actually west of there, next to the river. If anyone knows Martha Reed Jones, she lives in the old Jones Plantation House over on Robert Lane. And her house 
was on the head, this edge of town. Now the town is moving, the house is on the other edge of town. To give you an idea how slight the town is moving, but how much it had to move to satisfy the post office requirements of the town. That's another thing that Bozier and Webster, of course, all of them are going to in this. That leads us up to the next creation, of course, that's the great automobile. And it was in 1914 that they became a nationwide interest. And then you must get into that great states and federal argument to understand part of what was happening was when the automobile started occurring, started traveling across the United States, there was no national network. You could not get on a road in Atlanta, Georgia and ask directions. You generally had to go 20 miles and ask directions or go 20 miles and ask directions. So in 1914, so from California and a group from Georgia <coughs> wanted to create what was then the only all-weather, coast-to-coast -coast road in America. Route 66 is great, but it doesn't go coast-to-coast. -coast. Lincoln Highway did not go coast-to-coast, -coast, nor was it all-weather. That was what made the difference for the Dixie Overland Highway. It began in 1914 promoted as a self route. They made the states dedicate the money. They had the locals improve the road. To give you a small idea, from 1918 to 1926, they changed the route through Bossier Parish five times. Why did they do it? They get enough traffic on the section of the road, they burn the road out, they didn't have money to fix it, so they just moved the route. <laughs> they moved the route that they had. And at one time, it went through downtown Hall. And at one time, it didn't. One time, it went through downtown Bossier State, and then it went block over. Well, they kept changing it. It wasn't until 1926 that the Fed stepped in and they started making the roads, and that's when it became the United States Highway 8, was when the Fed stepped in and started a true nationwide program. So Bozier and Webster get to claim that. It is with quite irony and justified irony that I understand that John Watkins again was the first man to ever go to the state of Louisiana and secure grant money to build a road. And if you ever wonder why the road from here to Homer is so good and then it kind of peters out after that, think about John Watkins, because again, he was protecting those hill farmers in East Webster and in Claiborne Parish so that they could get their goods to market. Exactly the reason he was doing it. He never hit the fact why he was doing it. By the end, he was the state legislator. And you had the pull that it took to get that money laid so that we would have what is now Highway 79. He fought for that. So that is another thing that we shared. He knew you had to get those goods to market. That leads up to Louisiana Army Munition Plan of 1943. Maybe John can shed some light on this one of these years. I've never researched why they put the chemical plant where it is. Probably had something to do with Overton Brooks, very powerful senator from this area. Brooks VA Medical Center, Shreveport is named after him. I can think of a lot of things that Overton Brooks did. Overton Brooks probably fought to have that put here. And that's probably why it ended up where it did. Now, of course, this is beat up, it's over in Bozier Perry, so I get to claim a piece of it. But I also get to claim because it's in that old section of what I call the old Bozier. Bozier played a Bozier Webster connection here. All of us in it. It actually decimated our little town of Highland Town Solomon when it closed it up. If you ever get to go to Clark's Guns over there, sweet talking about you walk into their archery range over on the west side of the property. It's across the road from their repair shops. The bricks of the sawmill are still there. Took a dozer in the 1940s and piled them up. The railroad spurs are still there. You'll see the small gold <coughs> steel sticking straight up out of the ground where they just took the bozers, destroyed the ponds, piled the bricks up. They're still there. And if you're that interested, look around. The only good I was ever did, able to do with the metal detectors, I know of one spot in there that has a piece of metal. It's probably about the size of one of these large tables and it's on the ground. I've always wondered if it was one of the steam engines. I don't know. We may never know. To this day, I could probably take it over and dig it up if I ever had enough interest to keep. But that's another thing that Bozier and Webster was able to share. <clears throat> Ironically, 
I can mention the Bozier Strip with confidence. The Bozier Strip is there. We know of enough musicians from both Webster and Bozier Parish who benefited from it. I'll give you an aside that you may not be aware of, but when Perkins wrote Blue Suede Shoes, he was in a car going from Monroe to Longview. They had played in Monroe one night. They were going to a show in Longview the next night, and he wrote Blue Suede Shoes on the way through. So where exactly where did he write it? You can take your guess. But the thing that I love, I did a little bit of work on Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash and the crowd that came through losing a hay ride was the fact that Elvis Presley loved fresh fruit. They actually stopped at a stand in Webster Parish one time to buy some fruit and looked back and the car was on fire. They had parked in the grass and the muffler had caught the car on fire and it burned it burned out. It's one of the humorous stories that I found. And of course today, there are only a few things that we carry in shop. I mean, we still share Highway 80. We still share Interstate 20. We still try to work fairly close on making Louisiana to a scenic byway free so that they get to enjoy more Western, more Bossier parishes. We have committees dedicated to that. We, of course, still share judges and district attorneys. <clears throat> and I talked to them today. And a lot of people don't realize that judges and district attorney's offices for street court for Bossier and Webster are self supporting. They don't receive tax funds. They get their money from court filing cases and from fees that are come from the fines that are given to the criminals. So they're self-supporting in that sense. Ironically, a lot of other parishes have separated from their joint commissions. We don't see that happening anytime soon for Bozier and Webster because simply they have removed the ability to do that and probably will never be changed, which is good for one side or the other because one side is making more money than the other one we try to figure out which one. That's something that we share in common. Those are the common, ironically, a lot of people don't realize that even today, Princeton Post Office delivers mail to Goodwill Road. And of course, the Cotton Valley Post Office still delivers into Bossier Parish. So we still have that. And again, you get to the question, why does that matter? If you order anything by mail order and you live on Goodwill Road, you're going to give a Princeton Post Office zip and your sales tax is going to go to Bossier Parish. But if you live in North Bossier and you give a Cotton Valley address, your sales tax is going to go to Webster Parish. So people ask, well, why does it matter? Well, yeah, it does matter. But it is something that we share. So I get tickled when someone will say something about Princeton delivering a Goodwill. And I'll think, well, you got people living up here in Cleveland Springs that are getting mailed to Cotton Valley. So it really balances out in the long run. But those are the kinds of things that Bossier and Webster enjoy together. Their history comes together. They're people. Um, one of these days I'll have to work with John. One of the guys I'm looking for is Asbury Abney. A.A. Abney was a recorder in Bossier Parish, but he moved over here to Minden after 1871. I understand he served as a recorder over here, but I'm hunting for his picture. It's one of the things I'll be looking for. But I actually, the only thing I kicked myself is years ago I went on a little search on body call value. We were looking for an old 1859 place that used to have 4th of July celebration. And the lady who came was one of the lady Abby's descendants. And I really got tickled at her because she was in her 80s then. And I go down the hill and I find all these beautiful rooms and I dig them all up and I give them to my wife. And I get back up to the van. And of course she was elderly enough that she had not been able to walk down the water for money. And when I show up with all these bubbles, cries and said, oh you got all those for me? Well, you know what I had to do. <laughs> so I had to give my wife's balls to this lady and say, yes, I'm going to grab them for you. So I was very glad to do that. Those are some of the things that we share. So we're not as far apart as you think. We overlap. John talks about giving us back the land that's east of, that's west of the door key over there. Yeah. I'll have to give up Trace Atkins if you do that. Curtis <laughs> Curtis Mayfield, Curtis Mayfield is from the Good Little Road area. Person. First, okay, first you may fail, you had to give up him too, yeah, Steve. We'll, we'll yeah. keep that part over here. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> You'll have to decide about that. So, that's really it. At this time, I'd like to slow down and start answering questions.
because at least then I'm talking about something that two of us are interested in, and instead of just what I am. Yes, sir. Don't I recall that you weren't exactly happy to give up your part of uh, Bossier Parish to uh, Webster? Wonder a bit of acrimony on that. Cattle Parish? Uh, no. But your part of Bossier Parish that came over to Webster, wasn't there a bit of acrimony over that? No, believe it or not, from the Bossier newspapers, I've never seen any, any argument with it. They, you may know something I don't. I, I'm not saying, but I never saw anything published in the Bossier papers that indicated any kind of animosity for it. But then again, remember what I said before, it's always Bossier's belief that they were going to divide it on Black Hawk Bayou to make a North Bossier and a South Bossier. So it may be part of what you're talking about. I've never seen any indication of that. I've never seen it. Also, you mentioned yellow pine earlier. Do you know much about yellow pine? Not really. It's not in Bozier Parish, but, and I'll tell, and, and John may want to speak on that. What had happened, and I told John, I like to store it on all the things that I get to do is, I, for 10 years now, I've been taking approximately 200 Coke Middle Schools on a cemetery cruise every fourth Friday in October. Ironically, I'm born on Halloween, so they're now in the fall of the birthday. But Ms. Kayla Miller is one of the sponsoring teachers. Kayla is a granddaughter of the Smiths who served as mayors of Sydney, Louisiana. The first year I gave the cruise, she said, Cliff, do you know anything about Yellow Pine, Louisiana? And I said, no, I don't really want it. She said, I have a picture of the song. I said, well, I can guarantee you somebody over the website is looking for it. So for 10 years now, every year I would say, Kayla, did you find a picture of the Yellow Pine Sawmill? Well, at first it was in her grandmother's possession. Then her grandmother passed away, but she didn't know where it was. So then finally this year, uh, we gave the crew, and I saw her a few days before, and I said, Kayla, I'm talking to the Dorsey Historical Association on the 10th. It'd be mighty nice to have that picture that night to give them. So we did the cruise on how it actually ended up on Halloween this year. And I had to call the sheriff's department for some reason that evening. In fact, one of my renters filed bankruptcy, and I'm trying to figure out how to deal with that. When the gentleman on the other end of the line says, are you Cliff Carter? And I say, yes, sir. He said, well, my, he said, well I'm David Miller. I'm Caleb Miller's husband. He said, my wife spent half the night last night looking for a picture for you. <laughs> so I was able to say, well, I'm mighty glad that you found it, but John has the picture. You'll get to see what John was referring to. We also have two pictures of what is supposed to be the Yellow Pine School. When you look at the name above the door, it sure looks like J.P.'s school. But I blew up that section of the picture just to show you that it says, I believe it's called an Italian Y. It's got the J or a Roman Y. It's got a hook at the bottom. It's got a Y at the top. But I'll also show you on the picture where it's handwritten to say Yellow Pine School. That's my only connection with the Yellow Pine. My joke that I'll say it was on the wrong side of the door cheek for me, okay? <laughs> on y'all side. Let it on my side. But I am glad to find stuff like that. Yes, sir. On that shed hook, what kind of fee did they charge for the I've seen the rates, but I can't quote them, and it was like a penny a head for the cattle. And I want to say the most expensive was a 614, was maybe 10 cents, I think. There's somewhere in that neighborhood. He made 20000 a year. But remember now, what a lot of people don't realize is that those are web residents and, and Webster residents travel for free. A lot of people don't realize that. The way that John Watkins set it up, remember, he did it to protect these farmers over here. That was his entire purpose behind doing it. The only thing that made it quite interesting today is that he did not use common roads. He leased roads. So in 1889, Actually, a young man from Webster stood up underneath and hit his head and hurt him. And he sued. And Bozier and John, to get out of the litigation, gave the road to the police jury. And the police jury, to get out of trouble, had this good thing dismantled. And gave 20% of the lumbers to the guy dismantled and then sold the other 80% times to get rid of it. So it's route, you have to be really good to figure out what the route is. There are quite a few routes that are not built upon because he leased so much of the land that when the lease expired, those people closed that section of the road. You have a really good clue. You come out of brochures and you fall into the bottoms. You look over there to the right and you see that wealth and those kind that's sitting in the old shed road road bed. If you go to Tinsley Park, that's if you ever been to Dr. Michaud's office over off the new shed road, 
you look behind his office, there's a roadbed running between his office and the Kmart. That's the old shit roadbed. The only actual part that's on the road did now is that section from Airline Drive to Benton Road. That's on. And a lot of people always thought that the shed road went all the way to the Red River. It did not. It simply went to the old Benton Road over there on the north side of town and then turned it into the river. So it never made it all the way to the river. It got off the close. But it just made it far enough you could turn to go to the ferry. It came all the way to Red Shoe? Oh, yeah, it came all the way to Red Shoe. Which at the time was called Abercrombie City. George Abercrombie had established a place there and was betting on it becoming a flourishing place because it was on the eastern end of the Shed Road. Unfortunately, Mother Nature called or you know, the Grand Reaper called or whatever you call it, George passed away and his city never evolved. So, Red Sheep began. Why did Red, Red Sheep become hot? Huh? Why did Red Sheep become hot? It's, it, I tell this to people that are contacting me, I say, because Halton is a huge demographic term. When you say Halton, you're talking about everything from Lake Bissonneau to Benton to, the, to uh, Bossier City to the Webster Line. It's just a term that people use. So Red Shoot has always been separate, but yes, it's considered Halton, because it is a Halton zip code. A lot of people don't realize it. Princeton, Louisiana, 71067. Is completely surrounded by Halton. They have a Princeton post office and their own zip code that serves 3,000 people. And it's completely surrounded by Halton. The only place it varies is when it goes into Webster and delivers the good bit of road, which it does. Um, which is really wasted. I'm going you know, to my politics here. They spent close to a quarter of a million dollars building a new post office in Princeton, Louisiana to serve 3,000 people. But the whole area is surrounded by Halton. Anyway, Halton had a post office. <laughs> Doesn't make sense to this old country boy. Yes, sir. I was debating the shed road ran north of Chandler's also. That's not true? No. Not my shed road. I'm not sure what you're referring to, but. I already heard it did. I, I did. Yeah. Uh, no, John? No. It's well defined. And ironically, in 1924, when uh, Stone and Gallagher we did, did the tax books for those parishes, when they were able to answer. And the thing that helped us was in 1880, um, Foster family has a Governor Murphy Foster and his grandfather, Governor Murphy Foster. When the Fosters and Full Loves divided their 12th house and acre plantation, they divided it on Shed Road. So it made a well defined survey line. It's really easy to find out. But I, it'd be interesting to, to see what you're talking about. Because I'm one of those historians that know there's a grain of truth in that story somewhere. And there may have been a special road up there. Well, I thought I read something, something. But I do know, now just to just throw it out to you, there is a military road up there that was formed in 1828 by the United States government to deliver mail. And it went across the Daniels Ferry, later Sykes Ferry. And I think maybe part of what you're referring to is the old government road. Uh, General Pierre Bozier actually had part to leave that when he got postal, or he got the post office recognized on the west of the end of delivering mail through there. So it may be part of what you're talking about. Anybody else has a question? Yes, sir. What about the bike call and then getting into Red Shoe? How did, how did that change out? Where does it change? You coming down. Oh, where does it change names? Yeah, I mean, at Bike Call Lake. At the, at the dam here? No. I wish I'd have thought to bring the map, but a lot of people don't realize that as Bike Call comes down, it empties into a natural lake. When I talked about all that overflow and all that, Bike Call is a natural lake of its own. And it's still there today, great duck hunting area. It's only about this deep. Beautiful place, no, much further south than that. If you draw a line from, you know where Parker Road is off, Parker Road ends at Natural Bodkall Lake. But it ends in Bodkall Lake, then the water when it exits Bodkall Lake becomes Red Sheep Bay. So that's where the definition of the two streams occurs. And as I tell them, I'm still waiting for Bozier City to start using it as a water source. Because when they started cleaning up the uh, Paper Mill in Spring Hill, they estimated it was going to take 30 years to clear the water, it took seven years for the water to clear the water. So we're waiting to see if they ever start using that as a natural water source. Bozier has no plans at the moment. I'm not sure about it, but I was living on Bodkal when it was still nasty, and when they voted to make the paper mills for cleaning up Zach. So, but that's how the name change occurs there. Uh, I'll tell you something really good at it. Shelly may or may not have had more touched on Dundalk. 
Mark Touchstone, right, his, uh, Mark Norris is what I'm trying to say. He married one of the Touchstone girls of Touchstone Tax Department. And Mark Norris did the canoe trips down to Orchie and Bodkoff. And Mark's very smart on that stuff. So, only person who ever pull a skier with a rowboat. <laughs> 17 people in the canoe paddling like crazy so that Stacy Brown from the Shreveport Boat and Jurist Commission could ride on a ski paddle. <laughs> Any more questions? I think you get an idea of why I like to do history. It really has nothing to do with what I cover. It has to do with the people that I meet and I've enjoyed it incredibly the years that I've done it. I'll end with a very quick side of why I'm the official Bozier Paris historian. I have a very good friend named John Primes who writes for the Street Court Times. And for years, John would write the unofficial Bozier Paris historian. Finally, mothers being what mothers are, my mom finally says one day, How do you get them to quit writing unofficial Bozier historian? And I said, Mom, I guess you get somebody to make you the official historian. So I mentioned it to my buddy Eddie Shell on the Bozier Parish Police Street. <coughs> I did many passing things, told him my mother's concern. And it was about a month later that I get this call from this receptionist at Bozier Parish Police Street and they said, You are now the official Bozier Parish historian. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dying May 28th, 1995. You're the official Bozier Parish historian. If you want to know how much money I've made doing it, ask my wife. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, sure. I can show my evidence. Yeah. I will not lie to you. Kayla gave me these pictures, and she said, Cliff, I have a foggiest idea why my grandparents would have pictures of the young man saw it. Oops. Okay. He said, but my uncle Sam Merritt, who was Verna Hamner Smith's nephew. Yes. That's the sawmill. Has a date up here that we believe is like 417 of 85. No other markings on it that would indicate what it is. I'm getting some good. All right, this one. It's the one that has this JP or YP above the door, but down here, handwritten, as y'all kind of across here. This one is simply a closer picture of the same building, different group of students. That's what we want to see the picture of that postcard over there with this picture here. Show them the blow up. I want to argue with my point. This is where we always had fun. <laughs> Because when you look at the picture, you're going to say, that's the JP school. What's it got to do with the yellow fire? But when you take that header above that door and you blow it up, yep. you see rather quickly. Don't start me line, but that's J with a Y on the top of it. Now somebody explain to me what that means, and you know more about it. But it is handwritten on the picture, too, so we're confident that it is what it is. Well, Mary I also yeah. wrote John a 1918 letter board side. written yeah. which at the end of World War I yeah. by Lily Webb. Uh -huh. uh -oh. Now you're going to learn why I'm a writer because I don't remember things so good. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what Lily Webb's last name is, John. But she wrote it to her son Miller. He still overseas. And she got a letter from him and she was writing back from some of our family affairs. Well, it was something by the name of Billy LeBlanc. Lipscomb, isn't it? Huh? Is it Lipscomb? Say it. Lipscomb? Is that the name? No, no, no. It's Aero Letters. Yeah, yeah. Fine, yeah. But, uh, uh, gentlemen, I was at the road show we shot at the, at the Louisiana Museum a few weeks ago that got played this last weekend. And he walks up and he hands me the letter. That may be on an ounce on the wrong side of the door, cheap love, that's mentioned. He said, Well, I'm trying to get this letter to somebody and figure out who wrote it, or just give it to somebody that really belongs to. He said, It's no value. He said, I'm sure someone would be interested in it. Well, it, with names like Millard, I'm trying to think of some of the other names that are in the letter, it wasn't hard to figure out who wrote the letter and who it was to. And I had ironically told him that day, I said, Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give it to John Aiden. 
I'm good at passing love, by the way. <laughs> I said, I'll get the letter to John, and I'll let John figure out what he wants to do with it. Well, it was about four days ago that Billy LeBlanc called me, and he says, well, I want you to give the letter to the Dorchy Historical Museum. And I'm like, well, that's a pretty good clue, because I'm going to be speaking there in about four nights, so that works for me. So he now has the letter, and ironically, December, it will be the 90th year of the existence of the letter. It doesn't contain any historical information, but as you read it, you understand the lost art of writing a letter. We've lost that today. Even I'm too lazy to stick a stamp on the walk to the mailbox to love my email, but we've lost that part of communicating through letters, something that we have lost. So not only did I get to come and talk to you tonight, I came for your gifts, but at least I gave you the names of the people who actually get the credit for locating the stuff and getting it to you. Because I know how much I would be interested if someone came to me and said they had a picture of a sawmill from Bozier Parish because we found so few. And John referred to the picture of Mary Kane. It took us 18 years to find the picture of Mary Kane. It was found in a faraway state in a family who asked, why do you want a picture of Mary Kane? <laughs> there were eight generations removed from her. Didn't have the foggiest idea of her accomplishments as it related to Shreveport and Bossier. More than happy to share the picture with us, but did not want me revealing their name or the state where they live in, simply because they knew nothing about her and they don't want historians contacting them going, what do you know about Mary King? And they have to give the answer. I don't know, it's over there. So that's the reason we find these things, and we're lucky enough to find them. So I've actually gotten to the point where if I find one good picture a year, I'm feeling pretty proud of myself, but I brought y'all three good ones, so I guess it's good. <laughs> Thank you again very Cliff, much. Cliff, I've got to give you one thing around the small okay. world. I'm going to check later down, unless I'm badly mistaken, the sister of the man that wrote the letter lived next door to me when I grew up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please go ahead and do that. Also, the museum is going to be open. Uh, everything's turned on over there, so uh, maybe that, I don't know who, but somebody will run over there and open the doors for you. If you have not toured the museum, this is your, your chance to do it and just go around the corner. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Cliff will go and look at it since he hadn't been over before, but I really, really want to thank him. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot of local people that everybody knows, and a lot of people didn't uh, know, you know, what we were going to do with these events. But this is the type of thing that we want to do, you know, in the upcoming year is have people from from different parts. Uh, we've got planned uh, somebody to come from Homer uh, to speak to us about how Clayton Parish and Webster Parish at one time were all together. So these are just some of the things that we're that you have to look forward to in the upcoming year. Uh, but as I said, this is our last one for the year. So I want to thank all of you that came tonight and we look forward to more things next year. So thank you. Hang on one sec. <laughs>